Good morning, and welcome to worship here at First United Methodist Church of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. My name's Andy. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, we're excited for you to be with us. Now, whether you've been a, a member of our community for a long time, you're just joining us. Uh, we want to connect with you. We want to get to know you. Uh, you can find the link to our website underneath this video, and I encourage you to go on there and, and, and find ways to connect, find ways uh, for us to connect with you, for you to connect with our community and all that we're doing in our larger community of Murfreesboro and really throughout the world. Uh, we have a lot going on, and we'd love for you to be a part of that. Uh, that can be through, through giving to support those ministries, and, and we certainly appreciate that. But we'd also love for you to be a part of that ministry work as well. Uh, we have a lot of opportunities to, to be a part of our community and all this work. Uh, we, for instance, this coming Wednesday, we have our Ash Wednesday service. That's at 6.30 p.m. Uh, we'd love for you to be able to come if you're able and, and feel safe doing so. Uh, you also can still sign up for our life groups. Uh, that's an initiative that we're, we're starting here uh, that will continue through uh, this period of, of Lent. And we'd love for you to be a part of that, to get connected uh, closely with others uh, in our faith community and, and to wrestle with the gospel and, and what it means for our lives. Uh, but we also have a lot of service opportunities. Uh, for instance, uh, if you're at all interested in our disaster relief ministry, uh, we'd love for you to, to come to training, to come to know more. Uh, that's on February 28th from 1 to 4. You can find that information on our website as well. It doesn't obligate you, but if you'd like to learn about um, what we do, where we go, how we do it, and how we do it safely, uh, we'd love for you to participate in that. There's a lot of ways to get involved, and that's what we want to do, to get involved in the life of, yes, our church, but, but also our wider community. Today, as we, we come into our worship experience, we're going to sing, we're going to pray, and we're going to think deeply about Jesus' ministry. Uh, Reverend uh, Drew is going to talk to us today about uh, Jesus in Nazareth. When Jesus began his ministry, Jesus defined that ministry and his work through a passage from Isaiah, and his former friends from Nazareth didn't take kindly to that definition, what Jesus said he was about. And we're going to start to wrestle with what that means for us. How do we react to Jesus' own definition of his ministry, and what does that mean for us as we go forward? I'm glad you're here with us, and I'm, I'm looking forward to worshiping with you. Please prepare your hearts and minds as we come together to praise God. Water, wind, and fire, three of the elements that we just can't live without on this earth, when they're mixed in with our homes and our neighborhoods, it can spell disaster. Disasters come in all sorts of shapes and sizes from 
big hurricanes to uh, tornadoes, straight line winds, floods, and fire. A lot of things can happen in a short amount of time that can really upend someone's living situation. We have a disaster relief team here at First Methodist Church, and our goal is to go in after first responders assure us everything is safe. We go in to help provide that first step towards recovery, that first step of hope that things will return to the way they once were. You see, in the middle of a disaster, people's homes are destroyed, their personal belongings are scattered or completely unrecognizable with damage. Their lives are upended, and it's hard to see through the dust, the dirt, the mud, the tree limbs. It's hard to see where things are going to get better. In a short amount of time, a, a disaster relief team can come in, remove debris, remove trees, uh, take that first step, and give a homeowner hope that things will return, that things will get better. We need more people for our disaster relief teams. It takes a, a variety of skills uh, to effectively run a disaster relief team. Uh, we need people to operate chainsaws and bobcats. We need people to scoop with shovels and haul with wheelbarrows. We need people to drag limbs. We need people to work with the logistics of the thing, uh, the travel, the lodging, the food. We need people to just sit with homeowners, console them, talk to them, listen to them, and give them hope. Uh, we need a whole variety of people. We're going to host a training on February 28th. It's a Sunday at 1 p.m. here at the church. You can sign up online at fumcm.org and under the events tab. Sign up for that training. Uh, it's an UMCOR certified training that will teach you about safety, uh, protocols with uh, local authorities, that kind of stuff. Um, you'll get an early response team badge from UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief. Um, and you'll be ready, in a sense, to, to go out on these trips and make a difference in people's lives. And that's what we want to do. We want to provide hope in the middle of a desperate situation. As we come together for our time of prayer, we, of course, want to continue to remember all those who have been so deeply affected by this pandemic. Uh, some are, are still sick now. Some are, are recovering, and perhaps a very long recovery, as we know. Uh, some have had friends and family members who have been sick or, or had to quarantine, and, and many people have lost loved ones and are mourning in this period. And, and still others have had their, their daily lives, their, their livelihoods affected by losing jobs or the stress that comes along with all of this. Of course, we have all of our, our medical professionals and our first responders who are, are working so hard to take care of us all. Uh, if you would, bow with me as we go to God in prayer and remember all of this and all that we're doing. Uh, our Father God, we, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you give us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the peace that you give us. We thank you for the joy that you always try to burst out in our lives. Father, we, we ask that you continue to be everyone with everyone in this period. Lord, be with those who have been affected by the pandemic. Be with those who have lost loved ones. Be with those who are sick or taking care of loved ones who are. Father, be with us all in our anxieties and our fears. Yes, about the pandemic, but also about our political situation, about our, our social lives, about how we go through this time and create a new normal. Father, we ask that you, you bless us with wisdom and with knowledge. And Father, I particularly want to ask that you, you bless all of our youth and, and all of those sponsors who are going with them to warmth and winter right now as they try to do the same thing as teenagers and, and figure it out what it means to be with you in their daily lives and what that demands on their lives as it frees them to work and to walk in your kingdom. Lord, please give us all that peace let us be in that foundation of your spirit as we go about our days. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus and pray that prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hello, church. I'm Drew Shelley, one of the pastors here at First United Methodist Church of Murfreesboro. And if I haven't met you yet, I certainly look forward to having the chance to do that very soon. Uh, we're glad to be together for worship today. And Before we turn our hearts to Luke chapter 4, which is where you'll find our gospel lesson, uh, I'd invite you to find your way of a disciple card, either in your pocket or purse or wallet, or perhaps online on our church website. And let's take a look together at these uh, six elements of discipleship that help us think about what it means to follow Jesus on purpose. We're doing this both live and in person in the sanctuary, the modern worship space, and also in online church right here uh, now with you. We remember that as we think about the way of a disciple, we're thinking about, as I just said, following Jesus on purpose and what that means. We've named six elements of discipleship that you can find inside of your card. And today, I'd like for us to look at those first three, love the Lord your God, Love, you love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so let's think just a moment about that love of self there. We don't talk about that very much. Uh, some folks seem to have that covered well, and others struggle with what that might mean in their lives and what it means to accept God's forgiveness and all of those things that go uh, into uh, learning to 
Think of yourself as God thinks of you, learning to see yourself as God sees you. For now, as we enter this Lenten season, I would invite you to think about creating some space during this Lenten season as we get ready for Easter uh, to love yourself by spending time with God, Uh, not because uh, we need an extra thing to do, but because it's a way for us to allow God to speak to our hearts, to prepare us for that journey of Holy Week and ultimately Easter. It's a way for us to experience a closeness with God that feeds our souls and uh, nourishes us in the way that leads to life. So think about that, how you might do that. Uh, Perhaps it's uh, prayer each day, becoming part of our 24-7 prayer vigil. Perhaps it is uh, fasting in some way, leaving something behind so that you can focus specifically on God, being in God's presence, and letting God speak to you about uh, what God feels about you, how much you are loved, how thankful God is to know you, all those things that we find in Scripture. If you need some help with that, call one of us up here at the church or a friend or someone you uh, trust and know who's on this journey with Jesus, and let's talk together about how we might do this. Just a moment for us to think about our way of a disciple, what it means to follow Jesus as we remember our mission, growing disciples of Jesus Christ to love Him, know Him, and serve Him for the transformation of Murfreesboro and the world. Let's pray together now before we turn to Luke's Gospel, the fourth chapter. Oh God, we give you thanks for your call, for this invitation to true, meaningful discipleship as it plays out in our lives. We pray now for your Holy Spirit to move in a powerful way as we hear from Luke chapter 4, as we listen for your voice there through the words of Jesus, and as you uh, teach us some things about what it might mean for us to follow you. We love you, we praise you, and we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our gospel lesson again, Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 30. Let's hear the word of God together. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it to the attendant, and sat back and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
When I was first uh, starting out in ministry, I didn't know anything. I mean anything, <laughs> except that if you loved people and took care of them, they'd at least listen to what you had to say about Jesus, even if they didn't do anything with it. So I worked at it in that way, and over time, folks started to feel comfortable talking to me as their pastor. I especially remember the day a 65-year-old woman came to see me. Phyllis was really struggling with friendships in her life. I felt so ill-equipped to talk with her, but she really just wanted her pastor to pray with her, which I could do. The more we talked, the more I realized she was working through what I thought of as that that preschool deal, you know, when you have one best friend and you get jealous if anybody else talks to her, that's my best friend. You feel betrayed if anybody else plays with her. You get angry if somebody sits with her at lunch. Y'all know how this stuff works. It, it changes a bit as you go through grade school and into high school and even adulthood. It's always tough. It just looks different at different times of life. Our little Annabelle at four years old is dealing with it right now. I suggested to her that she might have two or three best friends or maybe just have a bunch of really good friends and let go of the superlatives. She said, no, I just won't have any. <laughs> this woman I mentioned had a, had a lifelong pattern of delighting in new friendships and then latching on so tightly with such force that she drove people away. A few months of joy, joyful uh, shopping and eating together, doing church things together and getting families together, why all of that would go off the rails just as soon as she heard that my new best friend did something with somebody else. I, I talked to a wise older pastor about it. I said, hey, I've got preschool in here. <laughs> he said, no, you don't. No, you don't. You have one of the fundamental struggles of human life. If you'll watch, you'll see that same dynamic wreak havoc all over the place. Now, y'all have heard me talk about living life with an open hand toward God and all of humanity. You're probably sick of hearing me talk about it, but this was the first time I actually saw it playing out. This woman had 65 years of practice choking the life out of every relationship she had, primarily because she was afraid to share the gift of love she was enjoying. She was terrified at a deep level that there wasn't enough to go around. Rewind 2,000 years to the synagogue at Nazareth. Jesus is at church. It's time for the scripture reading, which included a little preaching. He unfurls that scroll, translates on the fly from Hebrew to Aramaic, pulls together a little Isaiah 61 and some Isaiah 58. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to procla proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. He takes the place of teacher and says, This has been fulfilled in your hearing today. Luke tells us that the church is so happy. This is our boy, they say. What a sermon. He must really be a prophet. Look over there. That's where his family sits. They always sit right there. He went to Sunday school and youth group in the basement. He carved a notch in the back of that pew with his daddy's pocket knife. We're so proud. This is Joseph's son, the prophet. And you're here with us, Jesus. We've made a prophet. He is ours. Then there is a sudden shift in the story that is really hard to understand. It's like Jesus gets angry and gets on to them, and then they lose their minds and literally try to throw Jesus off a cliff. We have to dig a little to get at what has happened here. It seems like Jesus realizes their thoughts and their sense of owning him. They are sure that he'll be right there with them doing all sorts of miracles and bringing great honor to their community. With honor comes tourism, and tourism brings cash flow, and cash flow comes importance. You know how all this goes. That they'll, they'll eventually put a, a bronze statue of Jesus up somewhere, create a museum. Every other house in town will have a little plaque that says, Jesus ate here with us one time. His mama's house will become a place of pilgrimage. God's favor has settled upon them for their own enjoyment and benefit. Jesus then tells that parable about Dr. Cure Yourself and carries on about Elijah and Elisha, two great prophets of God, prophets of God whose work 
pushed the boundaries of propriety. The grace of God worked outside of God's people with some other people, and it enraged God's people. What do you mean you're not going to do all that stuff here? What do you mean moving beyond God's chosen, chosen people? What about your mama? What about your grandmama? This is neglect of the worst kind. It's disgraceful to even talk like this. We've poured into you your whole life, and now you're taking this good news of God's favor outside of these walls. We don't like that, Jesus. We don't like it at all. Oh, can you feel the fist closing around the good news that Jesus just preached? You see, because they were not open to the idea of others sharing in God's deliverance and favor, they themselves were unable to receive it. In their rage, they drive Jesus to the edge of town to throw him off a cliff. It is the saddest scene you can imagine as Jesus passes through the midst of his own people and goes on his way, leaving them looking into the abyss as hope walks away. It didn't have to be this way, but it was, because they were so afraid to share the gift of love which they could have enjoyed with the whole world. They must have worried that there wasn't enough to go around. Now, let's look for a moment at Jesus preaching, because Luke uses this to set the stage for everything Jesus is about. We find right here in Luke 4 the definition of discipleship as we learn this good news and practice living it as Jesus did. The words from Isaiah are words of deliverance for the poor, the captive, the blind, and the oppressed. This is what it means to live the year of the Lord's favor. The words operate at many different levels as we know spiritual, mental, emotional, but the foundation here is practical. Jesus came to proclaim God's deliverance for the actual poor, the captive, the blind, and the oppressed. Now, the rest of us will certainly experience deliverance too as we learn and practice this good news among the actual poor, captive, blind, and oppressed. This is the good news we find in Jesus. The year of the Lord's favor the opening announcement that God's kingdom is here among us, and this is its mission statement. When I read this, I, I close my eyes and I, I can see the Spirit of God setting the world free from all these shackles which have bound us forever in ways we don't even understand. He touches our eyes and they open like blind people seeing for the first time. Deliverance is poured out on the world and nobody is checking the list to see if I'm on it because everybody's on it. It is scandalous, and our discomfort at that scandal is the best measure of how tightly we're trying to keep it for ourselves. The floodgates of heaven open right there in Nazareth, and they will never be shut again. But God's people, like our friends at Nazareth, have many times tried to control the flow of this grace, this water, to steer it in our direction, to dam it up for our own provision, to make sure nobody is getting it who shouldn't be getting it. Every time we do this nonsense, we're like that woman who came to see me, Phyllis, choking the life out of every good thing we've ever had because we're terrified there isn't enough to go around. What do we do, sisters and brothers, when we get into this pattern again and again and again? I am learning that the first thing to do it's to take a deep breath and relax, to remember God is in charge of how this plays out, not us. God decides who can share in God's grace, and He has not put a limit on it yet. We should feel liberated by that. And then the second thing, I think one of the biggest problems we have is that we, we haven't very often seen the deliverance God promises in Jesus up close and personal. We just heard from Jesus himself where it's happening, the poor, the captive, the blind, the oppressed. I say, let's go to their side and see if they'll let us share life with them, not as benefactors and mentors and folks like that, but as sisters and brothers who are just as hungry to experience God's deliverance as they are. The promise is we'll find it there with them. We'll start to see what the kingdom looks like. We'll start to forget 
how important our stuff and our status is, and we'll find ourselves as willing agents of God's grace who recognize scandal and the deliverance of God as two sides of the same coin. When we do that, our death grip on life relaxes, and we discover that we can actually enjoy God's gift best when we hold it with an open hand. That woman, Phyllis, who couldn't maintain a relationship, she decided to start working at that church's food pantry. She worked the registration table and got to know the folks who came week after week after week. She heard their stories and felt their pain and was amazed to find how much joy these folks found in each other, in God, and even in life, as hard as it was for them. After a couple of years of that, she came to my office and wanted me to drive a group of 12 people to a cemetery out in the middle of nowhere so that they could have a picnic lunch on the anniversary of somebody's husband's death. I didn't know what, who it was or what she was even talking about. I explained to her, I said, Phyllis, I can't drive the church van because I have had too many speeding tickets. That's still a problem. And I, I don't know who anybody else who can drive it on such short notice. And Phyllis, I have a meeting in five minutes. She got so angry with me. She said, these are my friends. We are going to have lunch together at Sissy's husband's grave, and you're going to find somebody to drive us. They are already in the van, and they're getting hot. Oh, my goodness. I, I walked with her to the van trying to figure out how to diffuse this situation. No offense to anybody, but a van full of 60 to 80-year-old church women who are ready to go and sweating should always be approached with fear and trembling. Let me tell you what I saw when I got there. I looked in that van. I saw food pantry clients. I saw food pantry volunteers. I saw three of the women that Phyllis once rejected because of their unfaithfulness to her. Some were in pearls and nice clothes. Some were in sweatpants and t-shirts. Some looked like they had just come from the beauty shop and a few appeared to need a bath. They all had their lunches and brown paper sacks and were loudly enjoying themselves in the humid confines of that church van. Phyllis looked at me and said, now what? I said, just get in, just get in, I'll drive and I'll need to share somebody's lunch. <laughs> discipleship, intentional discipleship, encounters the gospel, hears the gospel, lives the gospel among the poor, captive, blind, and oppressed. Transformation happens to all involved, and we do it all over again. The grace and love of Jesus prove to be endless and limitless. Eventually, we learn that, and we start to become God's real people. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Thanks be to God. Amen.
so glad that you've been with us for worship today. I trust and hope and pray that you've had a, a meaningful encounter with the risen Christ as we've worshiped together. Uh, if you haven't yet signed up for life groups, we'd love for you to do that. There's still time. We have uh, about 18 life groups coming online this week, the week that is ahead of us, the week of uh, the 14th. We can find you a place or even start another life group to make sure we have enough room. The purpose of these life groups, as you've heard me say, is intentional Christian discipleship, just exactly what we've been talking about today. I look forward to getting to know you through those life groups and to helping you get plugged in as you as you let us know. As we go today, let us receive the grace of God offered in this blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may live in hope now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.
Thank you.